What's up, you guys? I'm Tere. Happy weekend. Um, we are so excited for the message Dean is about to share with you guys. I hope you enjoy it. And also, I want to remind you that our second spaces have kicked off. So if you're not in one, please go check them out. Sign up on ourchurch.us and enjoy this message and have a great week. Excellent. Excellent. Good morning. <clears throat> Forgive my uh, voice. It's a little scratchy today but thank, welcome to everybody who's watching online everybody say hey we're so glad that you're with us no matter how you're with us and thank you for all the people that are have been a part of the second spaces already there's one for grief groups and men's groups women's groups couples groups so good stuff the yoga group uh, my sister went to the yoga group that's like a miracle. Yes, I know you're here. I'm saying it in front of you. It's like, wow, God is moving. <laughs> anyway, so it's great. All right, take your Bibles if you would and turn uh, to Genesis chapter 3. Uh, uh, today I want to talk about why I'm not an atheist. When I was in the fourth grade, somebody, you know, went to Sunday school class somebody handed me something that they called the Apostles' Creed. And it's just bullet points. We actually sing a song here from time to time based on the Apostles' Creed. It says, uh, I believe in God the Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. La, da, 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 da. Like that, right? Wave your hand if you've ever sung it. Yeah. That's the Apostles' Creed put to music. And so today, I was, I was thinking a few months ago, I just want to walk through and say why I believe this stuff. Here's the first sentence of the Apostles' Creed. It says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Almighty means he's powerful enough to do everything. Father means we're his children. Right? This is a family proposition with an all-powerful God. He's bigger than cancer. He's bigger than the ER. He's bigger than drug addiction, right? He's bigger than divorce. He's bigger than bankruptcy. If this were a Christian group, some people would be saying amen. But since this is, since this is a godless crew, he's bigger than cancer. He's bigger than the ER. He's bigger than divorce. He's, all right, just shut. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator. It means you were designed. Those trees were designed. The sun, the moon, the stars, photosynthesis, the flowers, that newborn baby. Have you ever seen that? Wow, what a miracle. That he's a creator of heaven and earth. You want to say this with me? Say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. <clears throat> that was lame. But stand with me. Let's say it together. One more. I want to, we, we stand because we want to put some, some zest in it, right? Are you ready? Say, I believe, I believe. in God. The Father, the Father Almighty, creator, creator of heaven and earth. Wonderful. You may sit down. That's the premise today. Now, I've been a Jesus person. When I say that, I mean, I, I, my passion is Jesus. Uh, if a church talks about Jesus, I'm into church. If church isn't into Jesus, I'm not into church. You follow that, right? So, Jesus is my obsession. And I've been talking about Jesus for decades. I have Buddhist friends, Muslim friends. And in the spectrum of belief, they're relatively, they're progressing. And I, and I believe and I confess that if people are really searching for God, this is what I believe, if you're really searching for God, you're going to find Jesus. And, but, but there are a ton of people 
who, who are still in this other end of the spectrum where they're not even sure of this confession. We, they call themselves agnostics, meaning they don't know. Or a atheists, people who live without God or without the co concept of God. So today, I thought I'd just talk about why I'm not an atheist. Is there, <clears throat> is anybody here named Cassandra? No Cassandras in the, in the house, huh? There's, there's a, a myth, a Greek, a Greek mythology tells the story of Cassandra. And Cassandra, for whatever reason, had, had misbehaved. And because she wasn't perfect, uh, the, the gods, Apollo, I think it was, cursed Cassandra. And the curse that laid on Cassandra would, was that she would always know the truth and always speak the truth, but nobody would believe her. Sometimes being a, a pastor is a little bit like the Cassandra syndrome, where, where your humanity, I guess, gets in the way. People go, well, he's not perfect. That's right. Dean isn't perfect. But this isn't a Dean church. This is a Jesus church. Right? So, for one second, if you could, just put Dean aside. Put your religious background aside. Because some people go, well, I heard Catholic priests are this. Or I went to a Presbyterian church and they're that. And that church over there, they just care about money and all this crazy uh, things that happen with humans. Right? Your grandma was super religious and she used to beat you. All those things that really have nothing to do with Jesus. It has to do with your grandma. But she represented Jesus. She was the most emphatic religious person you know. So you discarded Jesus when you should have just edited your grandma. Right? Grandma's great, but grandma's not perfect. So uh, just put me aside and let's just not have any Cassandra moments here. Let me just tell you the truth. And the truth is, that if you're an atheist here or you're watching online, maybe somebody sent this to you, the facts aren't your problem. It's how you're processing the facts. Because all the people, a lot of the people anyway in this room have processed the same facts you have. Only they took those facts and made a commitment to Jesus and they found out, as the scripture says, test and see if God is good. And they tasted and they tested and they saw that it was real. It's real. That's why I'm here today. But what happens is we get thinking mistakes. I'm going to give you three quick ones that lots of people make, and it leads them to a place where they're living without God. By the way, you can be an atheist without confessing you're an atheist because there are lots of people who have a Bible in the house, and maybe they went to Sunday school, but they're living without God. They are practical atheists. Well, the whole idea of being a Jesus person is that it works its way into your schedule. It works its way into your checkbook. Is that an old reference checkbook? Do you write checks still? Okay. It works its way in, right? It works its way into your sexuality. Awfully quiet. It works its works its way into your parenting. I swear, you are the most godless people. No feedback. Say amen. Yeah, it works its way in. It's in the way we talk to each other. In the way we do business deals with each other. It works its way in. But we make these mistakes. Here's the first thing. Don't, the first mistake that people make is that they pretend that they're not really processing that information. They haven't dealt with it. But the fact of the matter is, you accept or reject every premise that comes across your, your mind. So, so you, uh, if I say, let me, let me give you a premise, Dean is going to run a marathon. As soon as I say it, you are processing what you know about me. Processing what you know about what I like to eat, how I like to spend my time, and you are making a decision whether or not that's ever going to happen, right? 
you're accepting and rejecting every premise. So you can't say, well, I haven't thought about it. You may not have thought a lot about it, but what you have thought about, you've decided not to commit to. Here's a second common mistake you see on this list. In order to really test something, you have to commit to that something. And if you haven't committed to it, you haven't really tested it. If I say, Aunt Dean is going, I could become the President of the United States. Now, here's what's going to happen. Uh, I'm now, instead of running a marathon, I'm running a, a, a campaign. And I'm going to become President. And so you are now accepting and rejecting that premise. You're taking what you think you know about me. You're ta taking what you think you know about the country. And you're turning to your spouse and you're saying, this country's going to hell. Right? If this is the guy. But, but then what you want to know is, am I really going to run? Am I going to commit myself to it? If I say something about a diet, hey, if you eat only oranges for 30 days, you'll lose 60 pounds. You're automatically making a, a premise, uh, accepting or rejecting the premise, but you'll never really know until you start eating oranges every day for a month, right? Well, lots of people have rejected God the Father, creator of heaven and earth, and you've never committed to it. And if you have committed to it, you've committed to it according to your principles. This is the common mistake. Everything that works, works according to its principles. So you can't work your own self-styled version of walking with Jesus. You're still drugging, running, gunning, sleeping around. You're not feeding your heart and your mind. So you're doing this thing according to your principles instead of according to the principles. If you work this book, this book will work in you. If you talk to God, God will talk back to you. You can say, well, I don't want to do that. I don't like going to church. I don't like hanging out with other Christians. And That's all right. There aren't hardly any Christians in this church. Come here. And we'll talk about Jesus. But we got to work it according to his ideas. You can't work it according to your, your own thing. I was listening to this deal on the Manson family the other day. Does anybody remember Charles Manson? Is that too old of a reference? <laughs> this guy, this commentator was saying about this family that murdered a bunch of people, this family, this commune. They said they practiced um, on this little ranch. Charles Manson and his followers practiced Christianity. And I was like, oh, oh what, what no, no, stop. That is not Christianity. That was like Charles Manson's funky version of it. That's not what this book talks about. You got to work the book. Okay, so I'm going to read you two stories. Everybody say two. About two different women, and one of them processed information, data, and made the wrong conclusion. And the other woman processed even less data, but her internal dialogue had faith in it, and she got a different outcome. So are you ready? i got to move fast here. Genesis chapter 3. And here's what it says. It says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord had made. This is the creation story. Some people are like, God couldn't create the world in seven days. That's just a metaphor. Whatever. Uh, you don't have to believe it's a literal story. I, I think that if God could create a human being and the rings around the planet Saturn and design photosynthesis in all of the, its beauty, I think he could probably do it in seven minutes. So I'm okay with seven days. But in this creation story, it gets into what they call the fall of man. And so the devil, the serpent, comes and he asks the woman, did God really say 
You must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden. This is how the devil always approaches a conversation, not with statements, with questions. He gets the statement, but he says, is it really true you can't sleep around? Is that right? Where is that in the Bible? Is it really true that you believe that God created the whole world in seven days just because you can't finish a project in seven days? <laughs> I'm sorry. That was the supervisor in me coming out, right? Yeah. It starts with a question. And he says, is it really true? And the woman replies with what she knows. This is what God has said, what God spoke. She doesn't own it. She says, he said. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are forbidden, not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. Now the enemy goes from asking questions to making statements. You will not die. You're going to be the first one. You're not going to be an addict. You're not going to blow up your marriage. You're not going to get into financial trouble. It doesn't really matter if you tithe. It doesn't matter if you tell a few lies. No, it's, lies aren't such bad things. If you're all of these things the devil tries to get you to compromise on. You know it, right? And this is his reply to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God. Now he elevates and appeals to her vanity. And he takes, and now he's twisting God's motives. Now he's saying God didn't have the right motives. And this still happens, by the way. People say, if, God, if God's good, how come my kid died? Now we're putting it on God. Everything good that happens is just you. Everything bad that happens is God. Right? It's just funny how, human, how we process information. And it says the woman was convinced. She was living in the Garden of Eden. She is walking with God every day in the cool of the night, Scripture says. But one conversation with this shrewd being, and she's convinced. And it tells us why she is convinced. Because she saw the tree was beautiful, and its fruit looked good. So it wasn't really about the facts. It was about what appealed to her eyes. He's so handsome. I know the Bible says I shouldn't be connected to somebody who's unequally yoked with me, but he, he's so good looking, and I can convert him. <laughs> what your eyes see and what sounds good to your appetite. Right? Yeah, that's how it works. Now, here's another story. This is from Mark chapter 5. That's woman number one who has all the evidence to believe that God is good. She's living in the garden and she still chooses destruction. Now this woman over here has all kinds of stuff going wrong. This is a story of a woman who encountered Jesus. She never met Jesus before and didn't know a lot about him. She'd only heard stories. And here's what it says. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. So this is female stuff going on, and for a decade or more, 12 years, she's going through this, and it says she'd suffered a bunch from many doctors, and over many years she'd spent everything she had to, to pay them, but she hadn't gotten better. In fact, she'd gotten worse. If you have your own Bible, just write in the margin, multi-care. Just write just put group health right there. Just put. <laughs> but that's what ha that's life, right? Isn't that life? So she's she's got this stuff going on, and and there are culture, and this this is a Jewish woman. So the fact that she was on this process for twelve years meant that her religion called her unclean, which meant she not only had this bleeding for twelve years. She hadn't seen her husband for 12 years. 
was in their religion as an unclean woman. She wouldn't be able to be with her husband. And she wouldn't be able to live in her home. And she wouldn't be able to see her kids. So this had affected every relationship that she had. Total destruction. And she heard about Jesus. She also, somebody told her, you know, there are people in your world who are going to come to Christ this Easter because of something you said. Something you said. You're like, well, they need evidence. They don't need evidence. They just need to hear how good Jesus has been to you. People got lots of evidence. Lots of evidence. They just heard. The Bible says that faith comes by facts. No, no, hold on. I'm screwing that up. No, no. It says faith comes by feelings. Is that it? No, the scripture says faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. So this is, this is a principle. You say, I wish I could believe in God, but I just don't. Yeah, but you don't hear any faith. You never, you never put yourself around faith. And that's why you're cynical, because cynicism works the same way. You hear cynical things, your brain starts processing in a cynical way, and you, ta-da, you are more cynical. You hear fearful things, you read about fearful things, you're worried about the future, you're worried about the market, it's all you take in, and your body was processing information, you give it. So this woman is hearing about Jesus, so she comes up behind him because she knows she's unclean. <clears throat> and she's not supposed to be touching anybody because she would make them unclean. This is key. Because anybody else that she would have touched, she would have transformed them. A Jewish woman who's unclean, touching a, a man, would now make that man unclean, and he would have to be separated from his family and separated from his kids. But when you touch Jesus... You don't change him, he changes you. That's why we come here every Sunday, right? Not to hear a sermon, but to meet Jesus, right? Not because we say, and this is how the world still processes, you, you may not be Jewish, but the world processes the information the same way. We say, I don't want to go to church because I've committed two types, too many different types of sins and I'm all messed up and I'm depressed. Because you think you're coming in here is going to change the people around you. It's not how faith works. Faith works where you bring all your sins and he changes you. Right? He lifts you. So she comes up behind. For she thought to herself. Underline that in your Bible. Highlight that on your phone. She was, the way she was processing the information. She thought, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Even though I'm unclean. Totally counter to everything she'd ever learned as a Jewish woman up to that point. From one or two stories she had heard about Jesus, she thought, that guy's different. And it says immediately the bleeding stopped. She could feel in her body she had been healed from her terrible condition. I'm going to bail out right there because I'm short on time. Two different women. One hears and processes through the ears of faith. And the other, with her eyes and appetite, makes the wrong decision. That's, how, that's why I'm not an atheist. Because somewhere along the line, I took all the data that you, you've all received the same data. Or do we have an ignorance problem in this country? We don't have an ignorance problem. We got more data than any group of people who have ever lived. Ever lived. You know, in your hand, in your purse, in your pocket, you've got dictionaries and thesauruses and sermons and commentaries and, and academic papers and you have access to every newspaper right now in this room. 
every newspaper ever written yesterday. You got it. We don't have an ignorance problem. It's the way we're processing. It's our thinking is set. You're relying on this gray matter between your ears. Your faith is in what you think you know. Here's a couple of errors. that I, This is for me. I'm not laying this on you. Although I will say the scripture has some really pointed things to say about how we think about God. For instance, in Psalm 14, it says, The fool says to himself, there is no God. The fool. Foolishness is not ignorance. Foolishness is somebody who's got the right information and decides to do the dumb thing anyway. You're not an idiot. Idiots are people who can't process information. Fools are people who have all the right data and they do what they know to be wrong. A fool, the Bible says, says to himself, there is no God. So here's what Dean has come to conclusion about him and why I'm not an atheist. This is my confidence on why, I, why I'm a follower of Jesus. I, I realized that it was never my doubt that was the problem. It was my, it was my affirmations. My affirmations were sick. My affirmations were like, hey, God, you've got to show me. Hey, God, you owe me. Hey, God, prove yourself to me. All these affirmations where when I realized I was the center of the universe and God was going to dance for me. It's not, it wasn't my doubts. God's not troubled by your doubts. Read this book. It's uh, start to finish full of stories about humans who kind of go, God, God's okay with your doubt. It's, it's the dumb stuff we affirm that's the problem. We say, no, I'm going to do it my way. I know what you said, God, but I think this is how it should be. Here's the second thing I realized. It wasn't my questions either. It's not my doubt. not my questions. It was the answers I thought I had. Oh, there's many ways to heaven. Really? <laughs> you, can ask, you can ask the question of God. God, how do I get to heaven? See what the Jesus answer is. For that matter, look at what Islam tells you the answer is. Look at what Buddha taught the answer to Nirvana is. Try them all. Test them. I'm here today not because... I shut out uh, New Age thinking. Not because I shut out Buddhist thinking. Not because I shut out Islamic thinking. I, I'm here today in this place, a follower of Jesus, because I tasted and I saw that Jesus is the Messiah. I love him. He loves me back. He, he loved me when I was still a sinner, and he's forgiven me. I'm here because it's real. And my questions never bothered God, and neither do yours. The fact that you, the world tells you you can't question God, don't question God, don't, no, question, try it, commit to it, but you can question. Here's the last thing. It's not your, the external facts. I was reading it, so I was listening to it, I'll send it to you. Send it to anybody who uh, we have an email, right? Uh, there's this uh, guy named David Berlinski, and he's a leading scientist in evolution, and he has rocked the. Uh, and also an atheist, by the way. Lots of smart people are atheists, uh, like David Berlinski. Every walk of life, funny people. Woody Allen is a. Is a Brad Pitt, George Clooney, atheists. Um, <laughs> I'm sure there are lots of athletes that are atheists, authors. Uh, Mark Twain is an atheist. Lots of people who don't process the information or process it differently than Scripture tells you to process it. But in, in all of this thing, uh, all these, like, like David Berlinski, he finally is studying evolution a proponent of evolution and he just recently wrote a book and said I can't in good conscience say that all of this is an accident so he said I'm still an atheist but put me down 
is not an evolution. Because there's no way in good conscience, he said, after studying all of this, I can say that this just happened on accident. Isn't that awesome? I mean, I have so much respect for people like that. He's not all the way there. But if you, if you can be humble enough, this is my prayer for Easter, that we'll have enough confidence in Jesus to share Jesus. So that like the woman with the issue of blood, somebody can hear what he's done for us. Because we've had hard days, have we not? When we've been in the hospital, have we not? We've been in rehab, have we not? Uh, one woman, as she walked out today, she said, Pastor, everything you listed, I've had. I've had the divorce. I lost a child. I have another child who's an addict. I have another child who doesn't talk to me. And she said, the only thing that held me together was Jesus. That's what I'm talking about. So we, when we share Jesus, after all we've been through, there's a perfect person in this room. We're going to believe that it's going to overcome the external facts because it was never really about the facts. It was always about what looked good to our eyes. It sounded like it would taste good. Will you stand with me? I'm going to ask the response team to come, and they're going to be standing up here. And here's my challenge this morning, that the first act of faith that you would do is to talk to God. The scripture says, you've heard me say it a hundred times, you have not because you asked not. If you say to me, I've never had a Big Mac, that tells me you've never been to McDonald's. You say, I've never had a Jamocha almond fudge ice cream. I say, I can tell you've never been to an ice cream shop because there are certain things that you get at certain places. And the scripture says, if you're not getting results from God, it's because you're not talking to God. You haven't been in his presence. So these men and women are going to be up here. When I say amen, don't go that way. Come this way. Because they've been through all the stuff you've been through. And we can agree together. Let's see. Let's just see. Let's see if God is a healer. Let's see if he can provide. Let's see if he can provide a partner. Let's see if he can get a new job. Let's see if he can guide you through a sticky business situation. Right? Uh, my confession this year is I am magnetic. God is drawing all the right people to me. He's pushing all the wrong people away from me. He's bringing all the right books, all the right podcasts, all the right friends to me. He's pushing all the wrong ideas away from me. That's my prayer. I ask for it every day. I ask God, bring right people to me. Bring the right ideas to me. Bring the right sermon to me. Bring the right music to me. Are you following me? Say, I get it. All right, let's pray. God, bless these people. Thank you for their faith that brought them here this morning. And would you build their faith enough that they could share it with somebody who today says, I think I'm an atheist. I think I'm an agnostic. And even the friends that are watching online, that maybe they can't say in, in any form of honesty that they're a follower of Jesus yet. But would just help them to commit to trying this thing, to taste and see that God is good. Let it be so. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. See you next weekend. Come and pray with somebody, will ya? Bless you. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope that you received as many blessings as I did from this message. Um, I would love for you if you could drop down in the comment section something that inspired you or that stuck out to you from this message today and I hope you guys have an amazing week.